Good morning. It is Friday, May the 21st. My name is Joe Haynes. I'm the preaching elder at Beacon Church right here on Vancouver Island in beautiful Victoria, British Columbia. Welcome to this devotional exposition of the book of Revelation. Today we're looking at the last portion of Revelation chapter 15. So get your Bible and let's turn together to Revelation chapter 15 and we'll read verses 5 through 8. Revelation 15 verses 5 through 8. After this I looked, and the sanctuary of the tent of witness in heaven was opened, and out of the sanctuary came the seven angels with the seven plagues, clothed in pure bright linen, with golden sashes around their chests. And one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives for ever and ever. And the sanctuary was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no one could enter the sanctuary until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. Let's pray. Father, I ask your blessing on this word this morning, Lord, that we would just have an inkling of the hope that is contained in this promise that your glory fills the sanctuary, but that, Lord, we would have a deep and a terrible fear of facing the wrath of your holiness, without the protective covering of the atoning blood of Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord, that this fear would not lead any single person who hears this word today to run from you, but rather to run to you and take shelter under, uh, in faith in Jesus Christ, under his blood. I pray this, Lord, for the salvation of souls, but I pray this for the expansion of your glory and your name and your reputation and fame in this earth that many might come to you and cling to you and find joy in you. And so you would be glorified in them and they, they be made safe in you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Last time we saw very briefly uh, how the seven final plagues represent the judgment of spiritual Babylon. And just as the rescue uh, of the sea of glass uh, through the sea of glass in the first couple verses, represents the salvation of spiritual Israel. So we saw both judgment and salvation. And today, looking at verses 5 to 8, we see the same two aspects uh, here present in the tent of witness. Judgment comes out of the tent, and then God's glory enters in and fills the tent. The significance of these images is what we'll be studying this morning. Verse 1 introduced the seven angels with seven final plagues. And look at verse 1. It says, Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and amazing, seven angels with seven plagues, which are the last, for with them the wrath of God is finished. John said, With them the wrath of God will be finished. When God has finished pouring out his wrath on the earth, it's going to be time for him at that time to fill the whole earth with glory with his glory. Wrath will give way to blessing. Isaiah chapter 61 indicates his blessing will far outweigh his wrath. His wrath is only brief, but his blessing is for a very long time. Uh, so Isaiah 61 verse 2 uh, uh, puts it like this. Isaiah calls uh, the brief wrath of God, he says, the day of vengeance of our God, the day of vengeance of our God. But then Isaiah suggests the blessing is for a very long time because he calls it the year of the Lord's favor. And the point of comparing those two things, the day and the year, is that uh, the blessing lasts a whole lot longer than his wrath ever did. The point of that comparison is that a year is much longer than a day, and so God's blessing is much greater and more enduring than his wrath. In the same way, you know, the time of God's seven final plagues, it seems to us like such a long time. But it isn't worth comparing to the joy or the duration of the glory that's to follow. Last time I suggested that the seven final plagues, which I'll call the era of the seven bowls, uh, because we'll see later in these verses there that they're, uh, the angels are given bowls, but I call it the era of the seven bowls. And last time we saw that it began around the late 16th or uh, possibly the early 17th century, and it lasts until Jesus comes back, until glory comes, because with chapter 15, verse 1, we see, with them the wrath of God is finished. 
it, it leads us right to the end of days. And, you know, if that uh, period began, if the period of the era of the seven bowls began in the late 16th or early 17th century, as I suggested last time, then, you know, it's been 400 years since then. And we're still living in the era of the seven bowls. And so this means that you and I today, in, in May 2021, we are living in the era of the seven bowls. We are living very close to the end of days right now. And, and we should expect to see evidence from the past 400 years as we consider history and even as we look at today and as we anticipate what tomorrow and the next years will bring, we should anticipate that the wrath of God is not yet finished. But we should also be waiting for it and eager for the glory that's to follow. We should be prepared for that. The second coming of Jesus Christ is even more certain than death. Doesn't 1 Corinthians 15 verse 1 promise that though all believers will be transformed and glorified on the day of the resurrection, not all believers are going to die. There will be some who are still alive when Christ returns, who don't die but are still translated, transfigured, transformed, just like that, in the blink of an eye. And you may be one of them. For a believer, the death of this body, this body, is such a very temporary thing. We need to see death as, as, as a, a very temporary thing. If we believe in Christ, resurrection is coming and resurrection is a very eternal thing, a very everlasting thing. Jesus is coming, but that's what I want you to take to heart this morning. Those believers who will rise again on resurrection day are not just, you know, people who believe these things are true. That's not what it means to be a believer. That's not all it means. It means that, but it means more. Those people who will rise again on Resurrection Day are those who believe Jesus and trust in him and love him. And that's the sort of faith, that's the quality of faith that needs to fill your heart. The more you long for Jesus, the more you miss him, and the more you can't wait for him to come back, the more you will see it as good news when it's his glory that fills the whole world. So that crowd standing on the side, side of the sea in verses 2 through 4, they're singing. And you remember why they're singing? They're singing because of Jesus. Are you? The vision of the tent of witness in verses 5 through 8 here today alludes to Exodus chapter 40. And this is the passage where God told Moses exactly how to set up the original tent of witness in the wilderness in Exodus chapter 40. I'll just read a, a, um, a few verses, excerpts from these, this passage in Exodus 40, beginning in verse 20. He took the testimony and put it into the ark and put the poles on the ark, and set the mercy seat above the ark. And he brought the ark into the tabernacle. Verse 24. He put the lampstand in the tent of meeting. Verse 26. He put the golden altar in the tent of meeting before the veil, and burned fragrant incense on it, as the Lord had commanded Moses. Verse 29. And he set the altar of burnt offering at the entrance of the tabernacle of the tent of meeting. Verse 33. So Moses finished the work. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting, because the cloud settled on it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. We'll look at our verses today as we, that we've already read here, but look at them again. After this I looked, and the sanctuary of the tent of witness in heaven was opened, and out of the sanctuary came the seven angels with the seven plagues, clothed in pure bright linen with golden sashes around their chests. And one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. And the sanctuary was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no one could enter the sanctuary until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. And Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled on it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. You see the strong parallels between these passages. Think about all those things. The Ark of the Covenant. The tent of meeting here is called the Ark 
or the t the tent of uh, testimony or tent of uh, witness, because of the uh, the commands of God, the, the Ten Commandments and the tablets of, of testimony placed inside uh, the ark, and that ark was placed inside the tent. But here we have uh, the ark of the covenant, the lampstand, the golden altar of incense, the altar of burnt offering, the basin of water. We've already seen all those things in the book of Revelation, prominent symbols throughout the book of Revelation. In Revelation chapter 1, John saw lampstands. In Revelation chapter 5, John saw the lamb who had been slain after seeing all the temple um, uh, furniture sort of portrayed again in highly symbolic terms in chapter 4. In Revelation chapter 8, John saw the altar of burnt offering and the altar of incense. In Revelation chapter 11 verse 19, John saw the ark of the testimony inside the tent. And now, after the seven angels come out of the tent, John sees the glory of God fill the tent. It's like God comes home. It's like he, he fills up the sanctuary with the, pre, his, the majesty of his glorious presence. The angels of his final judgment come out of the tent and the glory of God goes into the tent and it fills the tent. And that's what happened when Moses finished building and setting up the tent of witness or the tent of meeting. Here symbolically when the glory of God fills the tent it suggests that god has finished his work finished preparing his dwelling place his dwelling place we'll come back to that in a second but first didn't jesus tell his disciples in john 14 3 if i go and prepare a place for you i will come again and will take you to myself that where i am you may be also the angels of wrath Coming out of the tent seems like a kind of ending, doesn't it? It seems final. But the glory of God coming into the place that he has prepared as his dwelling place is a very long-awaited beginning. Has it ever occurred to you that the end of the world might really be just the beginning for you? Have you realized that if your greatest love your greatest love, the, the center of your life, the, the things that you hold dearest and most important to you, if, if that's all attached to something that's going to pass away when this world ends, have you realized so will you? But if you're waiting for and living for and longing for Jesus, at least if you, if you know you need to and you want to love him so much more than you do, and that's the deep desire of your heart. If you know that ultimate meaning and ultimate happiness and ultimate joy is found nothing in nothing that Jesus created, but in the Creator Himself, in Jesus the Lord, well, then the end of the world will just be the beginning of, of the glorious future with Jesus. He is what He is who you're waiting for. We have Jesus now, but it will be better then. Remember, after Jesus rose from the dead. He said something like that to Mary. He said, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. In John 20, 17. Paul wrote, So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. 1 Corinthians 15, 42. And in the Lord comfort his disciples, I go to prepare a place for you. Because, my friends, you and I are not yet fit for that coming kingdom. We are not yet ready physically to dwell with the Lord, but we will be. I wonder how many of the disappointments that we experience come from clinging to this place, sort of counting on and living for things that are perishable instead of those things that are imperishable. I, I wonder if how many of our disappointments and our, our anxieties and our losses and our sorrow comes from failing to wait for Jesus. Could we be more patient? Could we persevere more? Could we even enjoy God more now? If we learn to sort of loosen our grip on the here and now and hold more tightly to God's glory. Well, this sanctuary of the tent of witness is a sign that God is preparing a people for the glory to come. He is preparing a people. The tent is so much more than a tent. In, in verse 5, it says this. 
After this, I looked, and the sanctuary of the tent of witness in heaven was opened. When verse 5 calls it the sanctuary of the tent of witness, again, I, I said before, it's a reference to the, the way in which the, the, the testimony was placed inside the ark, and the ark was placed inside the tent, where God's holy presence rested above that ark of the covenant, above the mercy seat. But notice the word sanctuary here. And Revelation, any time the temple is mentioned, it's actually in Greek this word here, sanctuary. It's that word. It's not the word, the sanctuary here is, is not the word that John used in his gospel for the temple in Jerusalem. That was the Greek word hieron. But this word naos in John's gospel is the special word John uses for, or John, um, Jesus uses for his own body. It means God's house or God's dwelling place. So who dwells in God's dwelling place? Who gets to live in God's house? The Bible's promise is that the dwelling place he is preparing is to share with his people who come to him through his son. In Revelation 1, Jesus was standing in the sanctuary among his lampstands. And we saw at the end of that chapter that the lampstands symbolized his churches. He's with us now, but, but he will be physically with us then. And may, maybe it's a little bit like the way that we talk about still worshiping as a church now, but we're so looking forward to the day when we can worship again and meet together in person. If that's going to be better than what this is, imagine how much better it will be when we get to dwell with Jesus in person. Imagine the happiness of that day. In Revelation 11, verses 1 and 2, we saw true worshipers inside the temple. If you are a true worshiper of God's Son, God will never send you out of his dwelling place. This is how the New Testament speaks about the church of Jesus Christ. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in you? And that's the same Greek word for sanctuary as here, the dwelling place of God. 2 Corinthians uh, 6 quotes uh, God saying, As God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. 2 Corinthians 6.16 Ephesians 2 says that all believers in Jesus are being grown into a holy temple in the Lord. And Paul says it's a dwelling place. We are a dwelling place for his spirit. But what we discover next is, is that God is not just preparing a people to live with him. God is preparing a priesthood to serve him. Remember, Peter told his readers, you are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Isaiah 61 pictures the saints of the Lord as ministers of him throughout the earth. Revelation chapter 1, John praised Jesus, saying to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Well, back to Exodus chapter 40, as we close here today, where Moses set up the tabernacle of the tent of meeting. The last thing he saw was the bronze basin of water. The last thing he set up, rather, was the bronze basin of water that we talked about last time, Exodus 40, verse 30. He set the basin between the tent of meeting and the altar and put water in it for washing, with which Moses and Aaron and his sons washed their hands and their feet. When they went into the tent of meeting and when they approached the altar, they washed as the Lord commanded Moses. See, no priest was allowed to enter into God's presence to serve him in the sanctuary unless he washed as God commanded. So maybe you sort of assume that therefore God's not going to let very many people into his tent, into his dwelling place, that there's not very much room for more. But that crowd of people in Revelation chapter 15, in the first few verses, that crowd of people standing on the shore of the sea, singing their hearts out to Jesus, they have all already passed through the purifying sea. Every single one of them, John sees, has been made clean and prepared like a, a priest 
to enter God's dwelling place, his tabernacle. Revelation 3 verse 12 made a promise. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it. And we saw back then that conquering has to do not with fighting, but with believing. Believing in and holding fast to Jesus. Paul said in Romans 8.18, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. And that's the glorious day indicated by the gl uh, glory of God filling the tent. But before that day comes, God must finish pouring out his wrath. Verse 6 says, And out of the sanctuary came the seven angels with the seven plagues, clothed in pure bright linen, with golden sashes around their chests. And one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. There's a finality to these last seven judgments. That's dreadful. But while we live in this last era of the seven final plagues, the era of the seven bowls, Verse 8 is not saying that no one can come to God. Verse 8 says, And the sanctuary was filled with the smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no one could enter the sanctuary until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. Verse 8 is not saying no one may enter. Verse 8 is saying the time for us to dwell with God has not yet come. It's a call to, to come. It's a call to be prepared for that day. It's a call to now come and be washed in that water and be made clean by the blood of the Lamb who died for your sins and to let him make you one of his priests so that you're ready to serve him in his kingdom forever. Come and, and be ready to enter into the dwelling place of God, but come now by faith and look forward to that day when we will dwell with him together in person in the meantime, do not be surprised at the things that you must suffer, at the ordeals that we all have to face. As chapter 14, verse 12 said, Here is a call for the endurance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. His word foretold this era, but the glory is yet to come. Let's pray. God, we ask that you would so strengthen our hope and enliven our faith, Lord, that we would uh, be encouraged and strengthened to stand today and hold fast to endure and keep your commandments and keep the faith that is in Jesus Christ, your son. We look forward to him. We trust him. We love him. And we are waiting for him. Oh, Lord Jesus, come soon. We pray this in your name. Amen. Thanks for being with me today. I hope to be back with you next week on uh, Wednesday morning as we look into chapter 16. Until then, God bless.